Hello and welcome everyone to this podcast for cell biology. In this podcast, we're going to continue our discussion of cell communication and signaling. Remember, in the last podcast, we talked about how we have a cell here and how various mechanisms occur to allow a signal to either pass through the cell, to bind to a target inside the cell, to generate some kind of response. And then we spend a lot of time talking about how a signal may bind to something on the outside of the cell. And in binding to something on the outside of the cell, it generates some kind of response. As an example, we spent most of our time talking about G protein coupled receptors. In this podcast, we're going to talk primarily about enzyme coupled receptors. And in doing so, we're going to talk primarily about receptor tyrosine kinases. That we often just abbreviate as RTK. In talking about receptor tyrosine kinases, we're going to talk about, about a very specific one called RAS signaling. It's a very important pathway. It's linked to the health of a cell, and when it goes wrong, it's also linked to things like cancer. In talking about enzyme-coupled receptors, we'll talk about the importance of scaffold proteins. We will also want to talk a little bit, and we've already mentioned this before in the last podcast, but how do we deactivate a signal? And the last thing we're going to talk about will be single cell organisms and how they communicate. In lab, we've spent a lot of time talking about yeast, which is a single cell eukaryote. And, and now we want to spend just a little bit of time talking about that right now towards the end of this, this chapter. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with enzyme-coupled receptors and receptor tyrosine kinases. Okay, so let's start talking about receptor linked, or sometimes we call them receptor receptor coupled enzymes. And essentially what we mean by this is that we'll have our cell here and it will have a receptor attached to it in the plasma membrane. And just as we've seen before, a signal will bind to it. It could be a hormone or some other signal. And instead of activating a G protein, it will bind or form a dimer with another receptor, like so. And upon doing that, it will activate these ends and then it will phosphorylate these activated receptor linked enzymes will activate downstream targets by phosphorylating them and eventually this will lead to some desired response to demonstrate this i want to talk about a specific receptor linked enzyme called receptor tyrosine kinases Okay, so let's now move on to this specific enzyme-coupled receptor called receptor tyrosine kinase, which we'll call RTK. And we want to talk about how this RTK activates a protein called RAS. Tyrosine kinases by themselves are enzymes that add a phosphate group to tyrosines. Remember, kinases are enzymes that add phosphate groups to them. Tyrosine kinases are specific ones that add phosphate groups to tyrosines. Adding the re word receptor to it tells us that this tyrosine kinase acts as a receptor. It binds some kind of a signal. But let's draw this out and see exactly what it is this RTK does. And so let's draw a cell here. And then let's draw an inactive RTK. So as I said, it's inactive. As an inactive RTK, it exists as a monomer. Remember, a monomer is a protein that exists as a single subunit. In this case, it exists as these single monomers because they are not phosphorylated. All right, I'm going to take just a moment here and identify two important domains of these proteins. The first one is on the extracellular space. So let's write that over here, extracellular space. 
and this domain is called the signal binding domain. This part of the RTK binds to this signal to cause some kind of response, which we'll talk about in just a moment. On the cytosol side, we have these loops that form down here called the kinase domain. These domains of the RTK are what will phosphorylate targets. In fact, this monomer will phosphorylate this monomer and vice versa. So how is it that we're going to activate these two inactive RTKs? Well, let's say that other organs in this organism have produced a signal. And let's say that this signal is going to tell the cell to divide. So the way that this signal activates these inactive RTKs is it will bind to one of them and recruit the other so that they are now in close proximity to each other. Once they're in close proximity to each other, they will do one of a few things here. So it's bound to both halves here. It will cause the inactive RTK to become a dimer, and so now it is active. In doing so, it will phosphorylate the other RTK. So this one will phosphorylate over here, and this one here will phosphorylate over here. And I'm only drawing two here, but there may be several other places on it where it has phosphorylated. In doing so, it does one other thing here. It causes a conformational change. Now this, these phosphorylated domains here that have undergone this conformational change will now be able to bind to other proteins. We call these other proteins here adapter proteins, or some books call them bridging proteins. Either would be acceptable. Now this bridging protein can now activate other proteins as well. In this particular example, the signal is telling the cell to divide. And as we'll see in a moment, it's going to ultimately signal this protein called RAS. But before we talk about the pathway that RAS is involved, I'm going to describe RAS in a little bit more detail. Okay, so let's talk about RAS. RAS is a small GTP binding protein. It is found on the membrane. It's important in cell division. When it's activated, the cell will, will divide. It's also important in many developmental pathways. Once activated, it activates other kinases. Itself is a kinase. I should probably write that here. One last thing here I want to write. We've talked about it before, but let, I just want to remind you. When it's bound to GTP, it is active. When it's not bound to GTP, it's inactive. So it serves as this switch for cell division. Bind GTP to RAS, turns on cell division. Hydrolyze the GTP, turns off cell division. So let's talk more about how RAS actually carries out the signaling process for cell division. Okay, so let's come back here to our pathway. And remember, we have our adapter protein here that's interacted with these activated RTKs. This adapter, through mechanisms that we're not going to talk about right now, is going to change this inactive RAS, which is bound with GDP. It's going to change this inactive form to an active form. So now we're, we have an active RAS that has GTP bound to it. You might as well write GDP here. Okay, now that RAS is activated with this GTP molecule, it will trigger the phosphorylation of this next protein. Once phosphorylated, this next protein is active. I want to make it clear, though, that RAS itself is not a kinase. RAS itself does not do the phosphorylation, but rather 
it triggers events that allow for the phosphorylation of this next protein. And what we're going to call this is MAP kinase kinase kinase. This will now activate the next kinase by adding a phosphate group to it. We call this one, wait for it, it's very exciting, it's called MAP kinase kinase. This MAP kinase kinase, now that's active because it's been phosphorylated, will phosphorylate the next target, which we'll call MAP kinase. Now this MAP kinase can do one of a few things. It may phosphorylate some other protein in the cell. And this phosphorylated protein now is active and will now perform some sort of function resulting in cell division. Some of these pathways do something a little different. This MAP kinase now may phosphorylate a protein that enters the nucleus. And so this protein in the nucleus will turn on genes needed for cell division. Either result, whichever target MAP kinase has, the end result is going to be to increase cell division because that's what the signal originally told the cell to do. Now the last thing I want to talk about on this whiteboard is something called scaffold protein. So I'm going to need to erase some of this to explain what a scaffold protein does. So scaffold proteins, their main job is to make sure all the enzymes necessary to carry out this pathway are close to each other. If these enzymes are just randomly fl floating in the cytosol, it's going to be very ineffective at carrying out this signal. Okay, so what does the scaffolding protein do? In order to make this pathway more efficient, the scaffolding proteins hold our MAP kinase kinase kinase, our MAP kinase kinase, and finally our MAP kinase. It holds all three of these together so that when active RAS phosphorylates MAP, the, MAP, MAP kinase kinase kinase, it can easily and quickly phosphorylate MAP kinase kinase. And since our last one is also on here, it can efficiently phosphorylate our last one, MAP kinase. And now, having this nice efficient way to phosphorylate this one, MAP kinase, we can now go on and phosphorylate downstream targets. The scaffolding proteins can have great specificity so that they are binding the correct proteins, the correct enzymes, in order to respond to the proper RAS signal that comes into the cell. All right, the next thing I want to talk about here is the deactivation of a signal. We see how we turn things on and make a pathway go forward, but how do we turn it off? But I want to describe three ways that the signal can be deactivated. The first is changing a GTP bound protein to a GDP bound protein. We do that by hydrolyzing the GTP. In doing so, this, as I've said a few times, this acts as a switch between on and off. We can also take a phosphorylated protein and dephosphorylate it so it does not have the phosphate group on it anymore. Enzymes that do this are called phosphatases. Phosphatases remove that phosphate group. Remember that these, this reaction is reversible with a kinase, which then activates it again. The last way is by shifting a high concentration of second messengers to a low concentration of second messengers.
Remember, second messengers can be things like cyclic AMP, calcium, are two good examples. Cyclic AMP is converted into AMP. Calcium is reabsorbed by the ER. So these are just three ways that cells can turn on and off a signal. The last thing I want to talk about is signaling between unicellular organisms. Up to now we've been using examples of multicellular organisms, but it's important to recognize that much of what we know about signaling pathways in organisms like humans is from what we have learned from studying unicellular organisms. If you think about a human here in this amazing drawing, it's composed of greater than a trillion cells. These cells have to communicate. The cells in the brain have to communicate with the cells in the kidney to, just, to tell the kidneys to conserve water or to lose water. Other cells in the body have to respond to other tissues and the ability to grow or not grow signaling the immune system when there is an infection. So these are individual cells that work together to form this human or this larger organism here. Now, let's think about unicellular organisms. They may be eukaryotic, like yeast that you studied in lab, or dictostilium are examples of eukaryotic single cell organisms. But also this is true in bacteria, and archaea. But since we talked about them in lab, let's focus on yeast. So let's think about this single-celled yeast. As it divides, dies, grows, brings in certain nutrients, forms spores, as it makes all these pathway choices, it doesn't do so in isolation. Just as the cells in my kidneys rely on signals from my brain, this yeast cell receives signals from neighboring yeast cells. These yeast cells may secrete some sort of signal that I'm just going to draw as a square. And maybe this signal here is to cause the cells to form spores. And if there's just one cell here, there's not going to be enough signal. But the more cells that are around that are synthesizing and secreting these signals, the concentration goes up. And at some concentration, this signal will cause these cells here to form spores. And I'm going to simplify it by just drawing one big spore cell around them. More complicated than that, but for our purposes, this is the way we're going to draw it. So at high concentrations of this signal, we get spores. At low concentrations, no spores. So the best way to get more signal is to have more cells. So high concentrations of this signal equals spore formation. Low concentrations of this signal, no spores formed. We call this phenomenon quorum sensing. Quorum sensing relies on the concentrations of cells or perhaps a signal that's being released to cause some sort of signal to the cell to generate a specific response. In this case, we talked about the signal being released from yeast at a high concentration that forms a spore. As long as the concentration was low, no spores. Again, this is called quorum sensing. The populations of cells have to sense a thir certain threshold of signals before that response can occur. Your book talks about how bacteria uses quorum sensing to form a biofilm. They'll also provide another example of how eukaryotes, the dictostilium, uses it to form a multicellular mound of cells. Okay, that's all I have for cellular signaling. We talked about the pathway today of the receptor tyrosine kinases, and we talked about single-celled organisms and how they use quorum sensing to receive signals to stimulate some sort of a response. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you stop by and talk to me. If not, I'll see you in class. Bye. I'll be back.